As our series today opens, the camera pans across a beautiful view of the mountains and lakes, following a train passing by. Jake is sitting by one of the windows, staring aimlessly at the view outside until it finally stops at Denver. After getting off the train, Jake heads to the parking lot where he had left an old car and starts his drive to the town he grew up in, Jericho. When he finally gets there, he runs into his childhood friend Stanley who greets him warmly. When Jake explains that he just arrived in town, Stanley urges his old friend to come out with him that night so they can catch up, but Jake turns him down saying that he was only there to see his grandfather. After saying goodbye, Jake goes into the market to buy some sweets and accidentally runs into Emily. The two share an awkward hug as if there's been something between them in the past and catch up a bit about what's going on in their lives. When she asks him where he's been all this time, he tries to lie to her as he did with everyone, but she sees right through him. Finally getting home, he's greeted warmly by his mom Gail, whom he hasn't seen for the past five years. His brother Eric and his father Johnston soon followed into the room after hearing his voice. Hugging Eric, Jake gives his father a brisk nod before heading to the living room and starting the discussion about the money his grandfather had left him. Although his granddad had given it to him, Johnston had authority over it and he refused to give him a penny unless Jake was able to convince him that he was leading a more productive life. Gail suggests that they should go and see his grandfather's grave to calm the tension. And while the two were standing over the tombstone, Gail suggests that he should tell his father everything and that it would convince him to give him the money, but Jake was adamant about keeping the secret. Telling her that he has to return to Santiago, he drives away. And the people of the town were listening and watching broadcasting about what's been going on in the parliament when suddenly, all the signals are cut off. From a distance, the town of Jericho was able to see a large explosion followed by a mushroom cloud. At the house, Mayor Johnston is notified about what happened from his family and he tries to make some calls but it seems all the lines are down. He assumes that the explosion might have come from Denver and then orders the sheriff to gather everyone at the station, opting to pick up his son Eric on his own. While driving, Jake notices the mushroom cloud and gets into an accident with a distracted driver who missed his lane. Deputy Jimmy calms down his young son and tells him that he'll be back soon before heading out and at the station, Johnston and the police gather to discuss the action plan and attempt to figure out what happened. The mayor warns the cops not to use the word attack before they have concrete evidence. And while giving out orders, a worried mother interrupts Johnston and tells him that the school bus hasn't returned with all the children after they had left for a field trip. The mayor tries his best to calm the woman down and tells her that they will handle it immediately and Jake wakes up and finds out that he sustained some injuries to his leg from the crash and after checking for survivors in the other car and not finding any, he starts his journey back to town. On his way back, Jake encounters two panicked children on the road asking for help. And following them, he finds a school bus full of stranded children and one that's been severely hurt after her throat had been swollen shut. Jake attempts to help her by putting a small incision in her trachea and letting some air in, and in the desert, the sheriff and his deputy find a prisoner transport bus and assume everyone inside is dead, but they're attacked by one of the survivors. Dale, a teenage boy whose mom has been out of town during the explosion, finds a disturbing voicemail for her and goes to the mayor's home to avoid being alone. And there he finds a group of people gathered around, the room lit up with candles. Dale lets them hear the voicemail that he's received from his mom and explains that she was in Atlanta, proving that the explosion happened in more than one place. And as time goes by, the townspeople start to panic and resort to hogging and looting resources before they run away. Realizing that he needs to get the children to the hospital as soon as possible, Jake moves the unconscious driver and starts the bus and heads back to town. Jake makes it back to town just in time to save him from the impatient crowd who just kept asking questions that he didn't really have answers to. The worried families rush to the bus and start picking up their children and a proud Johnston helps his hurt son out of the bus and gets him some medical attention. Feeling motivated, Johnston gives a heartfelt speech to his community, urging them to stick together so they can all get through whatever is happening. He tells everyone to return to their houses until they can reconvene the following day. And next we see Emily walking on the road in the burning sun after her car runs out of gas. Hours later, a police car passes by her and she yells for them to stop. When they halt, Emily hurries to the car and explains that she saw dead birds all over the road, unaware of the nuclear explosion which the men explain. 
They tell her that they could give her a ride until the next town, and they let her on board. Back in town, Jake climbs to the roof of one of the tall buildings and notices the cloud holding all the toxic chemicals approaching the town. Panicking, he informs his father and the doctors in an attempt to find shelter until the rain passes. Jake and the doctor check the shelter under the hospital, while Johnston and his deputies try to clear out the other bunker, knowing that they wouldn't be able to fit everyone in town. Gracie, the town's supermarket owner, finds Dale lying on the floor of her store. While she was trying to wake him up, one of the townspeople starts knocking on the door, yelling at her to open so they can start stocking the shelves of the bunker with food. The town's police and firefighters drive around the street informing people to stay indoors and to cover every opening in the house with duct tape. The community hurries to do as they say, trying to keep their families safe. Eric tries to go to each establishment, informing people of what is about to happen and urging them to get down to the bunker. He encounters stubborn people in Mary's bar who were unwilling to go to the bunker in the town hall and he uses fear of radiation poisoning to convince them to change their minds. Out in the desert, Emily leads the cops to a nearby farm where she assumed that they could find gas. Sitting in the back, Emily notices tattoos on one of the men's neck and she finds that strange. When the men get out of the car to fill up the tank, the radio suddenly starts transmitting and a deputy explains that there's a prison bus out in the desert, warning everyone on the signal to be careful. Returning to the car, the imposters get Emily out of the car, still pretending to be police. While walking behind one of the men, she notices blood on the collar and is sure that they're not cops. The perp continues to ring the doorbell until he sees Bonnie walk up to the house. The man looks at the woman approaching with a sinister smile on his face and inviting them inside, Bonnie tells them that the key to the pump was with her brother Stanley who will be there in an hour. She then offers to make them some food and goes to the kitchen followed by Emily. And while they cook, Emily uses sign language to explain to Bonnie, who has a hearing disability, about the danger that they're in. After cooking the food and making the coffee, Emily distracts one of the men by accidentally pouring hot coffee on his hands and then suddenly steals one of the decorative guns on the wall without them seeing her. In the hospital located in town, Jake and his team were rushing to try to get to the hospital bunker ready in time. Heather, the school teacher who was in a bus accident, helps Jake fix the wiring so the fans can pump air into the bunker and assist with the electrical work. Dale notices Skylar, the most popular girl in school, refusing to go to the bunkers because she wants to wait for her parents at home. Feeling sorry for her, he takes supplies and heads over to her mansion, and at first, her mean demeanor chases him away, but she immediately apologizes and invites him in, scared to go through the storm alone. Although they tried their best, the hospital bunker was not ready to house people, making Jake and the doctors really anxious as the toxic rain would be there any minute. Having no other choice, Jake puts all the people in ambulances and buses and sends them down to the city hall. Inside the bunker located in City Hall, Robert, an ex-cop who used to work in one of the big cities, helps the mayor and his people make sure that they're fully prepped for what's about to come. Knowing that it might be their last chance to get any type of radio communication with the outside world, he tries to put together a makeshift one. After turning it on, he hears an SOS message come through and writes it down, shocked by what it said. Crumpling up the paper and putting it in his pocket, he avoids mentioning what he heard to anyone, telling Eric that he's unable to get the radio to work. When the hospital people arrive at Town Hall, they find out that there's no more space in the bunker and they start to panic. Out of choice and constrained by time, Jake decides to take them to the mine shaft. Back at the ranch, excusing herself, Emily goes through the bathroom and then sneaks out through the window. Crawling to the car, she tries to get a hold of someone on the radio to inform them about the escaped prisoners. While she was changing channels, Jake catches the message but Emily changes the signal before he can respond, forcing him to go after her. Jake then takes the truck and drives to the ranch like a madman. It's been a while since Emily had gone up to the bathroom, which made one of the prisoners suspicious, when suddenly, the radio the criminal had and the signal that she was searching sinks and he receives the message. Bonnie tries to escape, but she's caught by one of the men and held at a standstill between him and Emily. As his partner tries to sneak his way to her side to shoot her, Jake makes it and takes him down, giving Emily enough distraction to shoot the man holding Bonnie hostage. 
back at City Hall, Gail and Robert find Johnston on the floor of his office and drag him to the bunker for medical attention. Once he sees the mayor is safe, Robert goes back home to his family where he's confronted by his wife about what was going on, sure that he knew something. Angry, he orders her not to ask him any questions because he wasn't at liberty to say. And finally, as the rain pours, everyone in town stays in their shelters, holding their breath and hoping they'll make it till morning. We next see Robert, the ex-cop, who seems to know more than he's telling people, dressed up in full hazmat suit, and he drives the truck to one of the warehouses, gets the tools to move heavy items from the back, and disappears into one of the storage units. He then emerges with what looks like military equipment, which he loads back up into the moving truck and drives away. Trapped in Bonnie and her family's shade, Emily was sitting away from everybody, disturbed that she had committed murder. One of the officers that they saved from being tied and gagged in their police car tells Jake to give her time. A few hours later, Jake receives communication from his brother, letting him know that their father was okay. Once he makes sure everybody was safe, he lets Eric know to dig up the people in the mine shaft because he was forced to blow up the entrance to keep the radiation from seeping in. Heather tries to ration out water for everyone, making sure that there's enough to go around, and takes charge of keeping the calm in the community to stave off mass panic as they're sealed off. Back at the ranch, the basement door opens and Stanley walks in drenched in the rain. Bonnie tries to hug him, but Jake holds her back until they're sure that the rain is not radioactive. Calling April, the head doctor, and Eric's wife, they inform her about their situation. After asking them a few questions about Stanley's health, April tells them to give him a few spoons of iodine and to rush him to a clinic as soon as the rain stops. While he was taking the medicine, Stanley reveals that he's seen a few tanks head up to Denver, which surprises the group. In the city hall bunkers, things have started to calm down and Johnston seems to be feeling much better. Mary, the bar owner and Eric's mistress, watches him as he pretends to be a faithful husband around his family and feels hurt. Waiting for an opportune time, she speaks to him about what he was saying regarding the breakdown of his marriage, but he refuses to acknowledge anything and tells her that they need to get through what's happening first. Once the rain stops, Eric goes out to check the radiation level, but finds that there isn't any, letting the people stuck in the shelter out. Jake has the officers take Stanley and Bonnie to the hospital, while he calls Eric to help him dig up the people stuck in the mine. After drilling a hole in the rubble, Jake, Eric, and other townspeople get the rest of the community out of the shaft. Thinking of checking on her, Skylar's friend comes over and finds her playing cards with Dale. Making fun of her, they tell her to stay away from him because he's a strange kid. Feeling peer pressured, Skylar walks away with her friends. At the hospital, Jake suggests that they need to send people in all directions to gather information rather than stay in the dark. Although Gail is skeptical about this idea, Johnston agrees with his kid. Gathering Gary and the person running against Johnston for mayor, Jake sends them out in different directions to search for information. He and Emily decide to go to the southern route so they can also look for her disappeared fiancé. Eric tries to talk to Mary while she was bartending, and ignoring him, she starts to tend to her other customers until suddenly, the TV signal catches something, but they were all surprised to see that it's actually in Mandarin. People in the bar start to panic, assuming that they might be getting invaded, and after being embarrassed by Skylar's friends, Dale goes to Gracie's market and is shocked to see that it's empty. Gail comes in with some of the returned items, but Gracie explains that it wasn't enough to keep the store running and that without electricity, everything would go bad. And because of that, Gail suggests that they might as well cook everything for the townspeople. Going through with the plan to go looking for information, Gray packs a bag and was about to leave when he was stopped by Johnston, who thanks him for his bravery. Using the opportunity, Gray tries to undermine the mayor, but Johnston takes him to the office, punches him in the stomach, and warns him not to say anything more aggravating until the issue is resolved. Once the men start their journey, Jake goes south but a few miles away from town, he finds an empty plane that just used the road to land. Taking the black box, he returns to town and tries to listen to the recordings, and in the background, he hears the plane which Emily's fiancé was supposed to be in had landed safely on a field in Kansas, and goes to tell her this, and this makes her weep from happiness. At night, the community gathers to celebrate surviving the scary events of the previous day by holding a barbecue outside. After the party was over, Dale walks to the outskirts of the town and finds the train that was supposed to bring Gracie and all her shipments. And we see him smiling as he shines a light on piles and piles of goods. A day after the fallout had cleared, 
The flickering TV in the bar continues to show Jake and some of the townspeople images of chaos in different parts of the country while they try to pinpoint where it is. A few minutes later, the generator in the bar runs out of power and stops working, forcing Mary to close down the place early. On his way home, Jake runs into Heather and the two start walking down the street, and suddenly they hear glass breaking coming from one of the alleys and walk toward it. Jake notices that the back window of the pharmacy is broken, so he tells Heather to get help and goes inside. As he's looking around, he's startled by a sticky man with sores on his face, which seems to have come from radiation poisoning. Heather returns with help, then Jake and Stanley carry the sickly man to the hospital, and April provides him with basic medical attention, but is unable to do more because of the hospital's power situation and the lack of doctors. After getting the idea of siphoning gas from the stations from Heather, Jake tells April to keep an eye on the new patient and tries to leave, but the man stops him. Struggling to breathe, the patient introduces himself as Victor and then informs them that someone is coming for them. Gracie shows up at her supermarket after hearing something moving around inside, and when she enters, she's surprised by Dale, who'd managed to stock up the entire place with food and drinks that he had found inside the train. At the Hawkins residence, Robert was going over and over the cover story that he had prepared for his family, which really upsets his daughter Allison, making her storm out of the room. Hearing a knock outside, Robert goes to open it and finds Deputy Jimmy standing outside. The deputy explains that they had lost the sheriff and three other police during the prisoner attack and were looking for some people to fill in in the meantime. Although Robert initially refuses, Jimmy's persistence wins him over. At the gas station, Jake, Stanley and Heather start filling up a tank to take to the hospital. And once it was filled to the brim, they rush to the generator just as the hospital starts losing power, and inside, the loss of power has created chaos and the new patient's heart was giving out, and Jake and his friends managed to fill up the tank just in time for April to save the man's life. We then see Jake sitting next to Victor when he suddenly wakes up and tells him that there were people around the lake with a boat dock that needs his help and his daughter is with them. The man then suddenly has a seizure and passes out, and out on the street, Robert and two of the deputies find Shep's car, a man who had left town right after the incident after having his friend die on him. And they find Victor's wallet inside, and Robert seems to recognize the guy, but keeps the information to himself, telling the deputies to question the man. They bring the idea to Jake, who reminds them that Victor has third degree burns all over his body, and was in no position to answer any questions. Robert suggests that they should give him a dose of adrenaline to wake him up, and even offers to administer it himself. And he adds that they need to get information if they're gonna protect the community. Agreeing with Robert, Jake lets him administer the adrenaline, and when the man wakes up, Robert asks him about the car that he drove to town, and Victor explains that he found it by the side of the road. Victor was unable to say much due to all the pain caused by the severe burns, and Robert urges Jake to bring him some morphine. When Jake leaves the room, Robert confronts the sickly man, telling him that they said to only bring family. Victor tells him that he couldn't just let them die, but Robert is relentless, explaining that because of him, they were now down a man. Struggling to breathe, Victor informs the man hovering over him that there is a traitor in their midst. When Robert pushes him for more information, Victor goes into cardiac arrest and dies. Devastated at letting the man die, Jake goes to the bar and gets volunteers to help him retrieve the people Victor was talking about. When they get there, they find all 20 people were already dead from radiation poisoning. Back in Jericho, the townspeople hold a funeral for the 20 people that they can help and everyone else that they lost during that terrible time. Johnston leads the sermon, giving a speech to motivate his people, and in his home, Robert uses his secret computer to inform his people that there is a traitor in their midst and that their rendezvous point was no longer safe. The following morning, Jake Stanley and the IRS agent sent to audit Stanley's farm, Mimi, were exhausted after spending all night playing cards in the bar. Suddenly, the whole town is surprised by the random boost of power, lighting up their houses and stores. All the landlines in the town start ringing and start transmitting a pre-recorded video from Homeland Security, telling them that help is coming. Jake goes to his father's office, where Johnston was speaking to his deputies, and finds out that everyone has already heard the message. Eric suggests that they call the National Guard base in Gretbend, which Johnston agrees to. Realizing everything was taken care of, Jake goes home to get some rest, and finds his mother cleaning the house. Gail asks him if he's gonna leave once things calm down, but he tells her that he hasn't decided yet, 
and worried about her son, Gail pushes him to tell his father about his time away, explaining that Johnston would understand because he had gone to great lengths to fix the mess that Jake left when he skipped town. While they have a conversation, the town experiences a power spike, which causes a wire to snap outside the library. The rogue wire hits Emily, pushing her and causing her to pass out, and Heather, witnessing everything, tries to help Emily regain consciousness but is unsuccessful. Heather calls for help and April arrives immediately with her equipment, and while April takes over, Heather counts the students that she had with her before the incident and finds that one of the kids had gone inside the library before it started to burn. And panicking, Heather rushes inside looking for the lost child, Allison. After closing down the power grid to the library, the firefighters start spraying water on the fire, but are forced to stop because the water pressure on the pump stopped working. Coming up with an alternative, Jake and Stanley go down to the basement and try to open the large valve manually, but it was already rusted shut. Hearing that Heather was inside the building, Eric runs inside and finds them in one of the classes, but when he tries to get them out, the roof starts to collapse, trapping them inside. In the basement, Jake and Stanley manage to unhook the water valve, supplying the emergency system in the building and the firefighters with water. Once they got water flowing, Jake climbed up to the roof to see if he was successful, but noticed Robert sitting outside his house with a computer and a satellite antenna. Jake sees Robert look at him and hurries down to tell Eric that he has noticed another fire close to his house, and taking it upon himself to handle the situation, Jake gets some hose onto his truck and attempts to go to the school fire when he's cut off by Robert who offers to help him. Between the two, they manage to stop the fire before it destroys Eric's house, and at the bar, Mimi sees that Mary's happy and asks her what the occasion was. Mary confesses that Eric was going to tell his wife about them and that they would finally be together, and smiling sarcastically, Mimi tells the woman that men like Eric wouldn't leave their wives for women like them, but Mary was unwilling to listen. After all of the fires were under control, Eric goes to his house to find April sorting out the mess caused by the fire, and while he helps her, he finds divorce papers that she drew up before the bombs went off. Teary-eyed, she says that she did it because things hadn't been good between them and that she had changed her mind, begging him to think about things further and he agrees. At home, Jake finally decides to tell his father about the secret that he'd been keeping and sitting down his father, Jake begins to apologize for the person that he was 5 years ago, but when he tries to continue, Johnston interrupts him, telling him that he doesn't care about the past and that he's proud of him for the person that he's become. The family then gathers around to have dinner when suddenly, Stanley barges into the house and tells them that they're picking up a signal at the bar and that they should come quickly. Eric feels awkward about going to the bar after breaking his promise that he had made to Mary, but doesn't really have any other choice. And as soon as they get there, Eric and Mary share a look and he can see the disappointment in her eyes, and as the townspeople wait for someone to address them on the TV, the entire town starts to shake and Jake and the others hurry outside to see huge rockets being launched, their destination completely unknown to them. And that is where episode 5 of our series concludes.